I'm so glad to be here. God put this on my heart, whoa, <laughs> two months ago probably. I went to Cheryl and to Nick and said, man, i got to give this message for Father's Day. And it was well before Mother's Day even. I said, Lord, what are you doing? And uh, so I've just been churning him inside me to give this message today. So I want to turn and uh, talk about fathers. So John 5, 19 in the NIV version is Jesus talking to the Pharisees. He has claimed himself uh, to be the son of God and that God is his heavenly father. And that created an uproar. And he turns to the Pharisees and says, Most assuredly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the father do. For whatever he does... The Son also does in like manner. I'll make use of this. So as I contemplated that verse and the imagery of that, I wondered, what has your Father given you? What has been given to you by your Father? You know, what does a Father, what does a Son gain from a Father? And it came to me that there are three types of fathers in this world and perhaps a blend of the three kinds. And as I discuss these types of fathers, it may make you ponder what you were given. And if it creates strong feelings inside you, Nick will be singing a song that can allow you to seek the Heavenly Father for his support and peace. Like God. <laughs> the first set of fathers are those that need thanks. Thank you. <laughs> they were there. They encouraged you. They supported you. They may have taught you things. They may have helped launch you. And there's plenty of good fathers around us. But they deserve your thanks. Have you thanked your father, even outside of Father's Day? Have you thanked him for what he's given to you? The second set of fathers are those that need respect. Maybe you were rebellious, rebellious like some of us. <laughs> uh, you didn't even know or appreciate what your dad was giving you because you just wanted to do your own thing and live your own life. Do you need to say, I'm sorry, and then say thank you for what you are now recognizing that they've given you? The third set of fathers are perhaps the most difficult to discuss, and they're the ones that need forgiveness. They were somehow hurtful, mean, cruel, silent, not there, maybe even abusive. And in these situations, you need to work towards forgiveness. That doesn't mean putting yourself in harm's way, but bringing yourself to a place of peace with the difficulties they brought in your life. And it can be done, and Nick's song can help. So let me read from Hebrews 13.5 as you think about giving your heart to the Heavenly Father. In the Amplified Version of Hebrews 13.5, I will not in any way fail you, nor give you up, nor leave you without support. I will not, I will not, I will not in any degree leave you helpless, nor forsake you, nor let you down, or relax my hold on you. Assuredly not. So it can be done, and I encourage you during this time of worship, during this song, to think deeply about your fathers, almost as if you're embracing the Heavenly Father and working things out with your earthly father. And let that Heavenly Father help you to give thanks, to give respect, to give forgiveness, and above all, honor. Thank you. Uh, so not only is this week um, special because it's Father's Day, but also because we have guest speakers with us today. Um, we have the George family who works near Perth, Australia with us today to speak, uh, to share about what God is doing in them. Um, Melissa is actually downstairs with the kids right now, teaching them about Australia and the missions work there. So uh, I'd like to introduce Chris, who is a father of three and who will be discussing uh, 
in doing the sermon for today. Uh, Chris, if you'd like to come on up. Thank you, everybody. It's higher than it was this morning. <laughs> it, is, uh, it is a privilege to be here with you this morning, and I know that everybody who's a guest speaker always says that, uh, but it's not something that I just say lightly. It is a privilege uh, to be with your, you this morning. Um, I, I sort of was struck with that phrase, because I used to say it all the time just because that's what you say, um, but then one morning as I was saying it, I was struck with it really is a privilege. God gives me an opportunity to travel around to churches uh, and share what he is doing in another part of the world with his church. And that is, that's unbelievable to me. I never dreamed uh, when I was a kid uh, in a church in Wellsville, New York. That's where I grew up, just down the street here. I know Waylon because you guys had the nicest soccer field in the district. Uh, your sports facilities here were very nice, so we love to come and play. Uh, at Wayland. But in, in a parsonage, uh, growing up in a parsonage down in Wellsville, New York, I never dreamed that there would be a day where I could travel around and say, I've been a missionary on the field for 12 years. Uh, I never dreamed that there would be a day when I would say, I'm a missionary. But when I was 14 years old at a Wesleyan youth convention, God called me to be uh, in full-time ministry somewhere. And I had no idea what that meant when I was a 14-year-old kid. But as a 14-year-old kid going back to my high school, and when kids ask, what do you want to be when you grow up? And other kids saying, I want to be a police officer and, you know, whatever. Uh, and I would say, I don't know. I'm going to go and be a pastor somewhere. And they'd go, that's weird. <laughs> and I'd go, yeah, I know. Uh, but, but then when I was 16 years old at our, our uh, Western New York family camp at Houghton College, I felt a specific call by God to go and be a minister or be a, a full-time Christian worker in another country. He called me to be a missionary. And I had no idea what that meant either uh, at the age of 16. I had no idea where that meant or what that meant exactly. And so what, what happened that night is I came down the front and I said, okay, God, uh, we had an argument in the pew before I went. Uh, anyway, um, sort of a back and forth, you know, you don't really want this. And he said, yes, I do. And, you know, it was kind of one of those. Um, but then when I finally came down and said, all right, God, whatever you want with my life, okay. And so I came down to the front, and our, our DS prayed with me that night. He had no idea what I was praying about or whatever. But I remember I went out of that service, and I don't know if you know Houghton College, but they have out in front of Wesley Chapel, they have the quad. And I remember walking the quad at least four times, arguing with God about where I would go and where I wouldn't go. Um, and so praying a prayer of... God, I believe you're calling me to be a missionary, and I want you to do with my life whatever you want to do is a very scary prayer. And I thought for sure that that meant I was going to end up in a mud hut somewhere in the middle of some country that no one can pronounce, and, and no one would ever hear from me again unless I came home and traveled around to churches and, and said I need more money uh, sort of thing. And that's, that's sort of what I thought missions work was, but God opened my eyes. Uh, to something very, very different when I was at Indiana Wesleyan University anyway. But we, uh, God has sent us to go and be missionaries in Australia. And as a kid thinking I was going to end up in a mud hut somewhere, Australia sounds pretty good uh, because, you know, Australia is, is a very nice place. It's not a third world country. We have all of the things that you guys have here, uh, except Applebee's. We don't have Applebee's. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> But we have a lot of the things you have here. And so people ask us, why in the world would you be a missionary in Australia? Doesn't Australia look exactly like America? Well, in a lot of cases, it does look very similar to America. I didn't realize I had an accent until I went to Australia. But apparently, I have a very strong accent. And if you listen to my kids, if you have a conversation with my kids later, they actually sound Australian because they've lived there for their entire lives. But um, why in the world would you be a missionary in Australia? And that ans that, the answer to that question is very simple, yet very complex. Because Australia does look very similar to America, but there are a lot of differences. And one of those differences is that less than 2% of the population in Australia is churched. Less than 2% of the entire population has ever been to or says that they've gone to church or they go to church. Uh, it's one of the most secular cultures in the entire world. In fact, uh, a couple of weeks ago, Global Partners had all of our missionaries from all 90 some countries that were in all around the world, all 250 of us, uh, at Houghton College for a week uh, Amplify Mission Summit, 
which was an amazing time of just getting to know other missionaries and hearing stories about what God's doing in other parts of the world. And, and uh, it was an incredible time. But I remember one night I'm sitting at dinner with a missionary that I've known for, for a long time because he and Melissa grew up in the same church. And uh, we're sitting there having dinner and we're discussing what's going on in, in our fields. And I can tell you his name, but I can't tell you where he serves because that would put him in danger. He's in one of those countries. And I begin to share with him about Australian culture and about how nobody ever talks about spiritual stuff and, and that there's just this lack of spiritual anything. And he turns to me and he says this. He says, man, that would be so hard. And I'm thinking to myself, are you kidding me? Like you're in a country that I'm not allowed to name because of, you know, it would put you in danger. And you're telling me because people don't talk about spiritual stuff that that would be hard? He says, well, in my culture, at least people have some sort of spiritual background. You know, I can have conversations about spiritual stuff because they understand that side of their life. He says, man, it would be so hard to, to not even be able to talk about spiritual stuff. And I'm going, yeah, tell me about it, but are you kidding me? And so I learned very quickly that there's no easy mission fields. Wayland isn't an easy mission field. Australia is definitely not an easy mission field. Africa is not an easy mission field. Other countries we can't name aren't easy mission fields. I grew up in Wellsville, like I said, and Wellsville, if you include all of our surrounding areas, you have about 7,000 people, roughly. For those 7,000 people in that surrounding area, we have about 35 Christian churches. I mean, that's, that's on the high end. That's unusual, but it's not... It's not unheard of to have that many churches for that many people uh, in communities around America. And so that's the way I grew up. You know, that's the town I know, you know, our Youth for Christ. And we have, we have 35 churches that feed into that. And, and it's just, there's spiritual stuff going on all the time. Well, Melissa and I led a short-term team from Indiana Wesleyan University to Perth, Australia, which was by accident. If you want to hear the story about that, that's a good one. We'll tell you later. Um, but uh, we were supposed to go to somewhere else and we got deflected to Perth because some guy went out there with the idea of planting churches, and he needed some help, and so we took a team to help him out. We found ourselves uh, knocking on doors and surveying and doing some groundwork for a church plant in a suburb of about 7,000 people, and when we went over there, there was about 1.2, 1.3 million in the city of Perth, and the suburb was about 7,000. Until we planted a church there 10 years ago in that suburb of 7,000 people, there wasn't a single church there. And in fact, today, the city of Perth has grown to 2.1 million. Our suburb has grown from 7,000 to 12,000, and it is projected to, to break 20,000 by 2020. And it continues to grow, and even to this day, we are still the only church within the entire community of Lansdale. God surprises us. When we least expect it, God surprises us. We were at uh, camp two years ago. And uh, it was one of those times where we thought we had enough uniforms for everybody. You had all these pre-registrations, and then we bought some extras for everybody else as well. But the first day, uh, sort of, we had a lot more than we expected. And so we had a meeting at the end of the day of the first day, and we said, listen, we had so many people today. We have these two uniforms for the kids that have pre-registered um, that weren't here today. But other than that, we are out of uniforms. We have no more goodie bags, uniforms, or anything. And so we went to the closet, we dug around, we found three jerseys from the previous year that we could give. They were the wrong color, but at least, you know, they were jerseys. And so we thought, all right, those are sort of our emergency, but if extra kids show up, we don't have anything. So the next day, uh, everybody comes in, they get registered. Uh, I sort of held on to those two extra, you know, pre-registered bags because I didn't want them to go missing. And I found those kids, they were there the second day, I gave them their, their goodie bags and then three extra kids showed up, and they were going to stay the rest of the week, but there was a, a family that was there the, the first day that was only going to be there that day. And so we sort of worked out a swap with the jerseys uh, and all that sort of stuff. But everybody, everybody had a jersey. Everybody was happy, okay? But we had no more. That was it. We were out. And so after our introductions and stuff, you know, the cheerleaders stay inside and do their warm-ups and whatever in the world cheerleaders do. And the soccer players were out on the field doing their warm-ups out there. And I'm on the veranda area between the building and the field just having a prayer for the day. 
just saying, God, whatever you have for the day, I pray that this will happen. And, and uh, it was, you know, a great prayer, if you ask me. I don't know. But uh, anyway, I look up from that prayer, and I see a car pull in. And I think to myself, I hope these kids have uniforms. And so the car pulls in, and I'll never forget what I saw. I saw a Muslim mother. I knew she was Muslim because she was in full burqa. She got out of the car, took the kids out of the back seat, not in uniform, by the way, and she came in, and she walked straight in the hall, and she walked right up to Melissa because she recognized her because her daughter was in Dawson's class. And she said to Melissa, I can't really explain why I'm here. She said, for some reason, I was, you know, daydreaming or messing with something or whatever, and she said, I missed my turn to go home just over there. And she said, we came around the corner to turn around, and she said, my son noticed that there was something going on here, and he would like to know what it is. And Melissa shared with her what we were doing, that we were a church, and we were, you know, offering the kids a sports camp, and they were learning about the Bible and, and all this sort of stuff. You know, we're not going to hide who we are. And the mother says to her, well, do you have room for two more? And I'm overhearing this conversation, and I'm going, no. Not really, but in my heart, I'm going, yes. And so I, I turn into panic mode, right? I run into the kitchen, and I look around, and there's, there's nothing in there. I mean, there's, there's some lunches and stuff like that, but there's no uniforms or, or goodie bags. Checked under the counter, went, went out, and, and uh, went past their conversation, because I don't want to have this conversation, uh, and went into our, into our storage closet and started searching through the box that we found the old uniforms in the day before. I'm searching through, and I've, I find nothing. We have nothing. No goodie bags, no uniforms, no anything. And so I turn around to go back in the hall, and I'm approaching Melissa and this woman, and something tells me, go in the kitchen. And if I can do anything to avoid the conversation of, we don't have anything, uh, I will. And so I walk around them, and I go in the kitchen, and I kid you not, I walked in that kitchen, and there was a soccer uniform completely folded on top of a goodie bag with all the stuff, and a cheerleading uniform folded up with the goodie bag and all that sort of stuff sitting right on the counter. I have no idea where they came from. The right size. Now, my mom's, or my, my, my mom, my wife says sometimes I do, I do a, a dad look or a man look when I look for something. You know, one of those. And so there's, it, there's a possibility I missed it. But I don't know. But all I know is that that family was able to to be there and be ministered to all week. And on the Friday, we handed them a devotional and they took it home. Three weeks ago, I was, well, I guess a little more than three weeks ago now, <clears throat> I was at the hall on a Friday afternoon. We have our pre-registration happening. And that Muslim woman in her full burqa walked in to register her kids for this year. God is doing great things. God is moving in ways that we least expect it when we least expect it. When do you normally end? He's just smiling. He's like, Keep going. <laughs> I don't have time to get into my sermon, but here's the point of it. God has placed you where you are to be a disciple who makes disciples. It's great to share all those stories about, you know, how God opens doors and he does those great big things, but really the life of a missionary and the life of a disciple is in the day-to-day. -day. Being a disciple and making disciples is in the day-to-day -day living out our gifts out there so people see Jesus in us. The one story I will share from my sermon is John the Baptist, he's out with his disciples one day. And he's out sharing with them how to live. And he's sharing with them about how there's one who's coming that's greater than him. And they're out doing life together. And all of the sudden, it says in John 1, 35 and 36, it says, Jesus walked by. And John didn't ignore that opportunity. He turned and he said, that is Jesus, and his disciples turned and followed him. That's our life defined. 
we live our lives constantly encouraging people to be disciples. Sometimes it's difficult. Our life looks different than their life, and sometimes they're going to ask questions and go, why do you do it that way? But it also says, always be ready to give an account for the hope that you have. And when Jesus walks by, when the Spirit leads, and you can say, look, there's Jesus, and they turn and they follow Him, that's the greatest joy you could ever have. We live our lives constantly just looking for opportunities to create an encounter with God. I hope and I pray that that's your life as well. We as missionaries get the opportunity, the privilege really, to go around and share what God's doing. But God, God doesn't do all those things and we don't get those opportunities without the prayer and support of people. We know this because we've seen comparison. We've seen pastoral families who were more capable than I that went to Australia and got into that culture without people praying for them and it destroyed them in more ways than I want to talk about. But God has been faithful to us and we truly believe and we know that it's because we have like 600 people praying for us constantly. And so if you get anything out of today, that's, that's what I want you to get, is my request to you is that you would get on board, maybe not with us, maybe with another missionary, but you would begin to pray for them and what God is doing in making disciples on another part of the world. If you'd like to pray for our family, we have some prayer cards on our table up here. Uh, it's got our picture on it, so you can stick that on your refrigerator or your dartboard or wherever you want to put it. It doesn't really matter to us, as long as when you see it, you remember to pray. Uh, several years ago, I was at a family camp, I think it was central New York, um, and a woman came up to me, old woman, she's, you know, I don't know how old she was, but she came up to me and she gave me a hug. She says, she says, you wake me up a lot. I said, what in the world are you talking about? She said, seriously, you wake me up a lot. She said, a lot of times on a Saturday night at about three or four in the morning when I'm supposed to be getting my beauty sleep for church. You, I wake up, and I can't go back to sleep until I go to the refrigerator or whatever, and she says, I've figured out that I can't go back to sleep until I pray for you. She says, the Spirit wakes me up to pray for you, and I said, you know what, that's incredible because we're 12 or 13 hours ahead of you, and that's right about the time when people are deciding whether they're going to go to church that night or not. So these are dangerous. But I would request that if God is leading you to pray or to give or even to go, that you would be faithful in that. God might call you to go and be a disciple who makes disciples, even on the other side of the world. I don't know. Thank you, Chris, and the Georges for what you're doing across the world. We might not be able to go there and do that unless somebody's called. We'll let the Spirit of God call you where you need to go. But we can help them by supporting them in prayer and financially. So after the service in just a moment, uh, we're going to have ushers come right now. And if you feel like God's saying, I need to give to this. I need to be a part of what's happening somewhere where I can't do it. But I want to be a part of that. And we're going to give you a chance to maybe be a, a, a partner. What do you call them again? A faith promise partner in the future. Um, we're going to give you that, that uh, power in, in the next few weeks and months. But as ushers come right now, as we prepare to give, if you're writing a check out, write it to Chris George. Uh, it's written right here. Um, because they're living hand to mouth right now. All their finances are going to pay their bills at home in Australia while they're in the States living by w what we're supporting them with, okay? Amen? So um, as we give, um, go ahead and, and, and pass those now as you guys are doing. I want to say live inspired for what you can. This isn't all just about Australia and what God's doing over with the mates, okay, and the awful reptiles and snakes that they have to endure. That is why I'm not called to Australia, <laughs> Me and snakes don't agree, all right? But 
you, you, you know, Ryan's going to go to Texas. What is God going to inspire Ryan to do in Texas? Caitlin, I don't know where you're going to go, but you're going to graduate soon. What is God inspiring you to do? Lord, what are you inspiring Mike to do as he grabs that plate right now? Just bless him, Lord. What? What? <laughs> that might help you guys. Hey, you know, I, I just look at, you know, these faces of you that I love and I, your, your family. God, how, how can we find opportunity to do what they're talking about? in Australia, right here, in what I feel is probably a little chilled area as well in America, as far as the gospel's concerned, as far as talking about God's concerned, as far as committing to God, and finding the hope of salvation. How can we connect? Pray about that. Dream about that. And if your dreams are crazy about that, they're probably God's dreams. And you're going to go, what? But he's like, chill out. I know how to do it. But let me birth a dream in you. Without a vision, we perish. And we don't want to die today. It's Father's Day. All right. So let's pray as we wrap up. Look at the screen. Don't forget to sign up to receive updates from the missionaries at the Welcome Center downstairs. Thank you. In case you missed the screen. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing in our lives. We ask you to give us a dream that is unbelievably yours inconceivably doable by the Spirit of God. Opportunities are around us all over the place. And the pastors of the church can do so much, but we need your vision. What do you want us to do? Each person is given the opportunity to be led by your Spirit and to dream your dreams and to see it come to fruition. Lord, be with the Georges as they dream your dreams in a far-off land that needs the Spirit of God, needs salvation, needs you as Savior. So, Lord, have your will in your way and bring many, many into that narrow way that leads to eternal life. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go before the Georges, go before us as we go and change our world. Bless our dads today on Father's Day. Amen?